this R function that gives a symbolic, still undefined kind of thing. And you can see that it actually gets pretty interesting if you look at n squared MHV, like you get caps all over the place and whatever. But in order to verify that these formulas aren't just nonsense, we need to evaluate them, or we should evaluate them, and we should, um, and before we can do that, we need to convert the R's into something that we understand, you know, uh, you know something bosonic. This is some super function. So we can do that by, um, um, so the first step is to convert um, this into, so extracting component functions from super functions. And the first step that we want to do is to, is to uh, convert R invariants into standard form. Standard form. And I, I do have some particular conventions here, but this is, I mean, this is not conventions. There's a, there is a, um, I think, an objectively best way of talking about these things, which is to not think, I, so, if you're like me, and if you're like most people, at some point you get excited about fermionic variables and you decide to try to teach Mathematica what anti-symmetry, what anti-commutation means. Um, and then you realize that times is, is, is commutative, so you have to define your own version of times and you, maybe you infix it and it's like, a, anyway, it becomes a nightmare of, of, of a mess. Um, and the best way to do a symmetry, supersymmetry is to not have any fermions anywhere. And the way we can get rid of that is to talk about the coefficient, the, the bosonic data, which is the prefactor and the eta coefficients here. And that way we never need to expand something, we never need to look at, you know, we don't, we're just going to extract things um, from this set of bosonic data. Um, so, uh, recall, um, a, an, R, an R invariant is of this form, but a standard, Super function is is um, represented by the pair um, or the the map. You could say um, if you have f of z of some twisters or whatever argument you'd like um, times delta of of some bosonic some matrix of, of uh, bosonic functions dot eta. Um, this we are going to replace with um, the pair f, f of z, c of z. Um, where f is an ordinary function and c is a matrix of ordinary functions. We'll talk about extracting, I'll remind you how to extract components in a, in a moment. But let's just first convert this map for the R invariance. Okay, so um, bosonic parts of, uh, or prefactors, you know, the, the F part of R invariance. This is pretty trivial. But it will introduce us to a few bits of notation and functions that are kind of useful. So like, from the definition that's on the, written on the board, I want to take this and I want to write one over the product of all of these four brackets. And you could literally card code that by hand, but I want to teach you a function that will save you time in the future. Um, and the first step is to kind of extract from the R its arguments, which is done with this kind of thing. So a replacement where you just take the arguments of R and give you a list of the arguments of R. Now this is one of the only function I think in this lecture that doesn't, that the, the use of it that I'm going to use is really hard to digest from the help um, but there's a very useful function that you should learn about called partition. And unfortunately, this help file is not very helpful. It gives you a million options. It's usually true that if there's a function, if you know about a function and it almost does what you want it to do, there's a very good chance that somebody has an option, that there's an optional argument somewhere that will make it do what you, exactly what you want it to do. But I have looked at this thing and I can't figure out what the heck partition is supposed to be doing. But I will, so let me show you how partition works for me. Um, so I have some list, it can be this or it can be something else. Um, and if you say partition into ones, it gives you lists of one tuples. Um, if you say partition into two, it gives you, oh, the first two tuple and then the second two tuple, but that's not at all what we really want. This, there's an optional third argument which tells you the offset of these tuples and one is always the one you want. And it says A, B and then B, C. Oh, look, it's really close to what we want. And somehow from this 
help file, you need to discover there's an optional fourth argument that gives you, ah, look at that, it's the cyclic sets. And this is really useful. So if you do three, it gives you the cyclic thri triples. If you, do, if you do four, it gives you the cyclic quadruples, which is what we want here. And if you do five, it just gives you all the cycles, which is also very useful. So I don't know why this is not in the help file more, no, use, you know, more clearly, but the syntax partition comma something, which is the length of the thing you want, so four, one, one, or x11 is super, super useful. That's how you get the Park-Taylor factor, for example. It's like range, you know, range n, range 8, um, partition, oops, I need to spell things correctly. Um, 211, you know, it gives you exactly what you want. Okay, so we're going to take this, and now we, get, we have the arguments that we want um, from this, this thing. And for each of one of these things, we're going to write an angle bracket. And you, the important thing for me is that angle bracket is going to be forever symbolic. I'm never going to tell Mathematica what it is, or if I do, it's going to be super quarantined because I want to be able to play with it. I want to be able to manipulate it symbolically. So you need to keep Mathematica on a need-to-know basis, and that means never teaching it what a bracket is. If it tries to substitute determinants everywhere, you're, it's just a nightmare. Um, so I'm going to use something called angle bracket with slots. It'll have four slots, and that will eventually be what we talk about here. So if I do at, at, at over that, it gives you the list of the factors in the denominator, and I need to multiply them together, so times, and I need to divide, so that. Okay, we're actually done here. So bosonic part of an R invariant, so a product of R's um, is just R product um, applying this replacement rule. Done. Okay, um, fermionic parts of R invariants as you might imagine, less trivial. And it's mostly not that bad. So let's look at a case where we might need to do this. So um, recall that every, um, every R invariant contributes its own, um, its own delta function, function, which means so its own row, row of the, uh, final matrix of, a, of a eta coefficients. So let's try to construct one of these things. And let's look at a case where it's not just a single R invariant. So like the six particle n squared MHV, which is the MHV bar, in momentum twisters looks pretty silly. It's got a simple R invariant. That you know is going to be easy. And then it's got this scary looking one. Well, let's start with the easy one. So, the same kind of thing as before. We want, to, we want to take R with its arguments, and we want to get this list X out of it. But, and what I'm about to do is a little uh, uh, heavy-handed, but it will work just fine. So I want to get, this is going to have etas over all of those Xs. So it's going to involve an eta 1, 2, 3, 5, and 6. And it's also going to involve those four brackets, the same four brackets we had up here. So we can just even copy that thing down. And let me just kind of give you a, a uh, sorry. Um, okay, so these are the etas that we want, and these are the um, brackets that sit inside that delta function up there. And they're not quite lined up correctly. This first thing is not the first is not the coefficient of eta one. The second one is not the coefficient of eta two. So we need to rotate things a little bit, and um, you'll by trial and error figure out that rotating left on the right gives you this, and now we can dot them into each other. All right. What I've just generated now is the argument of that delta function. But that's not what we want. We want a matrix of coefficients. So how do you get coefficients? Import, I, I want to be clear that we, it's not just the coefficients. It depends on n, because um, even though this R invariant only involves 1, 2, 3, 5, and 6, I care about the coefficient of eta 4. Um, I also care about the coefficient of eta 10, if this is a 10 particle amplitude. So, the way to do this, and this is one of those cases where if you start doing tab completion, you'll see, oh, there's actually a million things that are coefficient-like. Um, the one we want is actually coefficient. Um, we take that thing and we, we look at the six twisters for six particles, or six etas for six particles, and we get this one by six matrix, or just a row vector, of, uh, of these eta coefficients. Perfect, it's behaving exactly what we want. So this would be like one row of our final matrix that we're going to get. All right, now let's see what goes, how bad it is for the, um, I'll, I'll need that. 
um, when you have these caps sitting around? Well, at first blush, it kind of looks like it's doing what it's supposed to be doing. So we have this pretty scary looking coefficient of eta three and then a coefficient of eta four. Those are at least sensible things. I mean, they look scary, but they're at least normal things. The problem is in these last two. So if I looked at the eta, if I applied this coefficient line of code, which I'm going to um, here, you only see three things picked up, three, four, and five. It has no idea what this thing is. It doesn't, it's not in the universe of eta's one through six. So we need to expand these, at least these eta's out. So um, recall that um, the eta's, well, maybe not recall that, let's say. Because the eta's are just components of the super twisters, they get shifted the same way. So what I mean by this is that eta of, um, let's say, a, um, a, b, um, and then uh, c, d, e, some plain c, d, e. This is just, we can define it to be um, eta a times this angle bracket, which because I'm being stylish right now, I'll call it this way. So B and then C, D, E plus eta B. It's just the same definition that we have up there. Um, and then C, D, E, which is the some three vector, some three plane, A. OK, so this is the rule for what the eta's, what the shifts are. And if we apply this enough times, in this case we only need to apply it once, but if we apply this rule enough times, we will then get it back into ordinary etas from the external you know, listing. So we take this thing and we say that, um, uh, that eta cap A, B, um, and then I'm going to call C, D, E a single thing with, um, okay, so C, D, E. This thing goes to eta A, angle bracket, um, B, C, D, E, plus eta B, angle bracket, C, D, E, comma, A. Okay, so now if you look at this thing, it actually looks like it's got coefficients of, you know, all the normal external etas. And we can apply this thing. We're going to need to apply it iteratively so we can do a double replacement eventually. But if we're going to do that, we might as well just put it in the line above because we're already applying this rule. Why not just add it to that part of the rule and then reply, apply it many times? So now the first line does what we want it to do. It expands all the capped etas into normal things, and now we can just take our coefficient like we did before. Um, but this is going to be unhuman readable, so we're not going to look at it. We'll see it in a, in, a, in a, we'll return to it when we're done. So we now have all the ingredients we want. So we want, we're going to define a function called eta coefficients um, of an R product. But it's not actually just a function of the R products, because the matrix that we're going to generate has a length, it's a size n, or that's not a length, it's the length of each row. Um, and it depends on n, because I need to tell, I need to ask the coefficients of the external twisters. So I care about what n is here, and it's going to depend on it. Let's do block. Um, um, what we need is, first we need a list of all the r's. So um, a list of the r's, so r list can be cases. R product from zero to infinity. So I need, you need the zero to infinity because sometimes you have a single R invariant as your amplitude. For example, like R amp five one is a very simple thing. Um, so you need including the zeroth entry. And then we would get delta rows. So these are the rows of the delta function. Delta rows are, is basically just R list. And then we're going to apply this rule every single time. Um, until it stops, um, and I need to apply it repeatedly. Okay, so now this is going to return these, uh, it's going to return this, uh, these kinds of expressions, and every, for each R invariant, it's going to give you something like that. And we just need to extract from each of those the coefficient list. So coefficient, and this is our temporary function, eta range n delta rows. And this will return a matrix of eta coefficients. So let's Let's see how this works. So let's put everything together. Um, to super function, and it depends on n, and it depends on just some R product expression. Very simple thing. It's just going to be bosonic part of R product. And then 
uh, I should have tested this eta coefficients. And then eta coefficients and our product. Okay, so this should now convert it into the standardized form where it's a tuple of a, of a bosonic function and a matrix. But let's just make sure that this eta coefficients was doing something even remotely sensible. So R amp 62, this one that was scary looking, apply the first one and we can say eta coefficients 6 that. Uh, that's still not very human readable, but now it's a, it's a 2 by 6 matrix. Let's look at matrix form. Okay, this looks vaguely plausible. In one row, we have a row with five non-vanishing entries, and the bottom row, we've got this mess of caps and stuff, but that might be correct. So we can now define super amplitudes. So super amp um, n and k is just going to be to super function on everything that we have. Um, I should call this its own section, putting things together. Um, R amp, n and k. Okay, so that's the super amp, and we also want random versions. So super amp, random, so R amp, random. Okay, great. So now we have it in the standard form. So let's extract components. Extracting uh, component functions from, super fun from standardized super functions. So recall that uh, each super function is a, can be thought of a as a list, can be viewed as a list of uh, n choose k to the fourth power for n equals four, um, particular bosonic functions, so component. Each of these is simply given as the following. It's um, a bosonic part or bosonic prefactor um, times um, product, uh, should, uh, product, the multiplication of four k by k um, minors of the matrix of eta coefficients. Okay, so we didn't have to teach Mathematica what an anti-commuting thing was or anything like that. It's very simple. We're just going to take this matrix and we're going to grab four k by k minors of it. Um, for our purposes, we really just need um, just need one component, um, a particularly nice one. Nice component is related to the um, so-called splits. Helicity um, gluonic um, amplitude. Um, it is generated by um, uh, four minors, which are all the same, same and consecutive. So one particular one is the, the simplest possible one. You take the, the, the first k by k minor, you multiply it four times. I could use power. I could make this very simple, but I'm actually going to write it in a kind of a heavy-handed way because if you want to go home and, and edit this, I'm going to write it in a way that it's going to be very easy for you to like not do this particular component and generalize it to whatever component you'd like. So I'm going to write a pretty ugly, an unnecessarily ugly function for split component. And it's a function of uh, bosonic part and eta coefficients. And it's going to return something just because I know, I know where some landmines are. If eta coefficients is empty, um, I can't really talk about it very well. So this is the case of MHV amplitudes. So that's just going to avoid a, a bug in the code. Uh, this notebook is not great for user errors, but I want to avoid that one. So now, if, 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 if it's not an empty matrix, let's, do, let's just do what we wanted. So it's bosonic part times this product of minors of the matrix, which is also called det, eta coefficients. And we want to grab all the, it's a column vector, so we want to grab all of the rows of which columns, the ones specified by some list which defines a minor. And minor is going to go from, is going to be chosen from a list of minors, minor list. Okay, so we haven't defined what this thing is yet. This is not a working function yet. So for, the, for this particular one, we're going to 
we need, first need to know what k is, which is the length of eta coefficients. That's what k is. And the minor list, which I might as well define inside the block here, um, minor list. So this is, all you need to do is just change minor, make this a function of minor list, and it will give you, it will now work for everything. So I'm just, this is why I'm building it in such a weird way, because um, you just need to replace what minor list is. So I really want is I want range k, I want the first k by k things, and I want four copies of it. Um, and there's an easy way of doing it, but it's probably a little silly looking, which is um, to map a function like x over something of length four. So this is the function, which does not depend on anything. It's just the function that is the constant x, and you apply it over the integers four times. You could also apply it over a, b, c, d. It gives you the same output. So, but the idea here is if I instead put here like range three, it would give me three copies. It would give me four copies of that. So here I'm going to say range k, range four. OK. So that just gives me k by k four times, or a list of one through k four times. So I think we're actually kind of ready. So let's see if, um, if this is making sense. So split component, super amp, we're going to always look at the random one because I want to see that we're making sense. Let's look at the seven particle NMHV amplitude. Now this is going to be a list of normal functions. Um, two super function, oh, it doesn't, ah, ha, 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 depended on n. Okay, so do you see what I, I the mistake there? Super function had two arguments. It had an n, because it has to tell you how big the matrix is, and I didn't put it in there. So luckily, it was that kind of an error. Now everything should work. All right, good. That actually looks kind of normal, right? It actually looks kind of Park Taylor-like, but in momentum twisters. You got a, some tri thing to the third power upstairs. You got this. And we got lots of them. You can start seeing. So like, let's see what, let's just make sure that our other amplitudes look right, too. Oh, that's unreadable. But, you know, 8, 2, ugh. Um, that's pretty, pretty horrible. But it is now, if we look at 8, 1, for example, we see that now we're just returning bosonic functions. And if we are doing things correctly, and that's what we're going to do in a moment, that's our next step, is to verify, to check that this rational, that the sum of these terms is equal to the sum of those terms is equal to the sum of those terms. And this is pretty remarkable, because if you do this 8, 2 randomized, you'll get uh, 2,000 different 20-term formulas. It's kind of incredible if they all are the same. So that's what we're going to be testing next. OK, so last stage, evaluation um, and verification, much more important than evaluation. Um, so um, goal, very important goal, um, check Internally, so not referring to some other person's computer package or your uh, office mate's code or your advisor's code or anything like that. You just want to, you're, you're computing something you've never, nobody's ever computed before, and you just want to make sure that you're right, and we want to verify internally that we didn't screw up. So check internally that um, everything above made sense, makes sense. And we're going to do this two, two ways, which neither of them are rigorous, but they're pretty darn convincing. Um, we're going to do two checks, two checks. Um, the first, we're going to do numerical equivalence of different uh, BCFW formulae. We're going to evaluate these kinds of things and, uh, for a bunch of different of these, and we're going to see if they're the same thing. And we're also going to check the numerical uh, cancellation of so-called spurious poles which we'll come to in a moment. But let's start with our first thing. So num numerical, that. in order for this to do this, we need to evaluate things. So evaluation, and this is where everything becomes dangerous because we're, we're going to be forced to tell Mathematica what an angle bracket is. And as soon as we do that, like, it's, it's, it's dangerous, bad. So um, we want to be very cautious. Um, um, OK, so the first step is um, to define some kinematics, some kinematic data. Um, so for this, we really, need to talk, we really need to introduce some momentum twisters. The good news um, is that, recall, um, any completely generic 
meaning completely randomly generated um, set of momentum twisters uh, corresponds to on-shell momentum conserving um, external uh, momenta. So we can generate, we can generate uh, these, these reference momentum twister components, which is just going to be a global variable that's going to be kind of quarantined off from the rest of Mathematica. We can define something momentum twister components. It's always a good idea to, I mean, not everybody does this, and even I don't do it all the time, but um, it's, it's a good idea to name things with silly long names because it, complete, it makes it very clear that nobody else will ever use that variable. So momentum twister components. We can, we can define momentum twister components using random numbers. Um, note, we may as well uh, define more than we need. Why? Because uh, it doesn't really matter the, how many extra twisters we have. Any set will be a valid set. So let's just pick them. You know, they're completely arbitrary. So we want to pick random. And the best numbers, by far the best numbers, are integers. So random, at least my favorite numbers. OK. Um, random integer is one of these functions that you should also become familiar with. Random integer. It has lots of options. Most of these are kind of obvious. Like the first slot tells you the range for the random thing. Let's go pick 1 through 25. And then if you give it another argument, it'll generate, say, four random numbers. I could map this over a bunch of things, but, it's, but there's more optional arguments. So if I do 2 comma 4, it gives me two four tuples of random integers. Or I can do 20 of them or 15 of them. Let's define 15 momentum twisters. OK, so that's 15 four vectors randomly chosen. Mo momentum twist components, define it right up here. OK. And now here's where all the danger comes in. We need to define this. And what I'm about to do is actually new. I thought of it uh, during uh, lunch. So I haven't, I've, I've never tried this before. It's not my favorite option, but it might be faster and more clear. So let's talk about value defining things. So um, teach Mathematica temporarily what angle brackets are. Um, and one thing, I think, yeah, so it occurred to me that one way to do this, not my favorite way, but probably the, the cleanest way, would be to define something that's not an angle bracket and teach Mathematica what that thing is. And so maybe an N angle bracket. So some other symbol that it will not occur in any of our expressions, and I will define what that thing is. And because I'm going to actually hard code it, I'm going to have Mathematica save it forever. I, I also, when I define it, I want to clear it. Um, because if you ever change what these momentum twister components are, you have to, I'm, you're going to have to change what this lookup table is. Oh, so not clear, clear all. So let's say numerical angle bracket. If, it has, if it's all integers, then we're going to set it, and we're going to store it permanently in memory, or not, you know, with this thing, we're going to set just like we did before, and where it's going to be debt momentum twister components x. That's pretty good. And n angle bracket. This is the this is the one that's a little bit harder. Um, the triple one means it can be a, a this is a, a symbol that represents a sequence of slots of arbitrary length, including empty. That's important if you don't want to do many cases of this. A B, and then C D E and then y. So that means that if you see an angle, this is a numerical angle bracket, if it has a cap anywhere in the middle, it can be at the beginning, it can be at the end, because x can be empty, y can be empty, whatever. We're going to replace it with this, and we can do, we're, we can also hard code it, n, a, b, y, x, cap, a, b, c, d, e, y, is now is our standard definition. So it's n, a, b, x, a, y, angle bracket, no, no, NAB, it's always, these are all numerical things now, B, C, D, E, plus X, B, Y. I'm just putting in that definition up there. Um, and NAB, C, D, E, A. Okay, and all right, that looks a little dangerous. Some of you can probably see what I'm gonna do. So if we look at like um, R amp, you know, six, well, not R amp. We want to look at like split component 
um, of super amp, well, random, it doesn't matter, super amp 62, say, we get this, and all I need to do now is just replace angle bracket goes to numerical angle bracket, and we get a number out. I want to actually formalize that. So I'm going to define a, this is heavy handed for sure, but I'm going to say evaluate expression means expression with this replacement. Okay, so now I have a function called evaluate, and I can just evaluate this thing. Okay. All did it, 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 it threw in these definitions, um, but angle bracket stays completely symbolic, which is good. All right, let's look at like 7, 1. All right, but it's, oh, well now I want to randomize it. Okay, so we get these kinds of lists of terms. Notice they're pretty different looking numbers. They're weird looking numbers. Big rational expressions. All right, here's the first test of truth total. So if we did this right, the sum of all the terms will be the same. Ah, see, look at that, pretty good. Let's make it more impressive, let's say 8, 1, ah. Okay, that k equals 1, that's a little too easy, it's too, n in squared mhv, 8 particle n squared mhv. Okay, you see that number, it's kind of floating because the size is changing, oh look at that. All these 20 term formulas, I think we're pretty good. I can suppress the output of the first line if you believe that it's actually showing a list, and we do 10 particles at k equals 3. Oops, what, what did I just do? Yeah, perfect. So, and if you are not impressed that this giant sum of 175 terms is the same as that sum of 175 terms, is the same as that, you know, you could, you, you know, I'll leave it as an exercise for you to determine the Bayesian probability, you know, likelihood that I'm making a mistake this is all accidental. I mean, um, um, that's like a fingerprint for this function. Um, okay, so I think actually we're, we've we have we have checked, we have verified. Um, I'm pretty convinced that it's uh, that's correct. But I want to do one more test, and we could do this the fancy way, like analytically, and take residues to see that the spurious poles all cancel. But I'm going to do it in a um, uh, much more sloppy way, which is a feature of having integers everywhere. So checking um, spurious pole cancellation. Um, so uh, note for any planar or any ordered amplitude, the only physical poles, and I'm actually going to call this behind a function in a second. So physical poles um, that can appear in the denominator of an amplitude, well, physical poles I don't, that can appear are of the form these consecutive things. So P A plus dot 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 plus, oops, ugh. I actually don't know how to get rid of that thing. Okay, I, I hate. Um, Nick, uh, Kolya Gromov is a kind of a Mathematica hacker, and he uh, hard coded. Um, a way to remove that forever. Um, <laughs> but I forgot how he did it, so it's, uh, um, <laughs> anyway. Um, okay, so this is, um, in terms of these momentum twisters, it's A minus one A, B minus one B. So it's, um, so it's a four bracket consisting of a, of a pair of consecutive tuples, two tuples. So let's generate this list. Oh yeah, and uh, for integer, um, momentum twisters, all four bra all brackets are uh, integers. Um, which is pretty darn useful. This is going to give us a really weak test, but I, I promise it's still not, it's still kind of impressive. So let's try with n equals seven, um, or maybe six, because it's going to be a longer list. Um, the first step is to generate these tuples. So partition range n, range n, 2, 1, 1. That gives us all of the pairs that we want. And now I want to grab them in groups, and I want to glue them into four brackets. So let's take subsets of this list. And the second argument of subsets tells you how, long, how big of a subset you want. So these are all the two tuple subsets. So these are the n choose two um, sets. And we want to actually glue them all together, which can be done with this join triple at. So here are our lists. And you'll notice that some of them are dangerous, right? 
5661, that vanishes. I mean, it's not dangerous, it's just that that thing is zero. Um, that's the same as P6. So we'd like to delete those. And we can do delete cases. Um, there are fancier ways of doing this, but an easy way to do it right now is X, Y, Y, Z. So if you have a repeated middle index, this is actually not good enough. Um, and I know because I made this mistake yesterday. Um, there's this one here, one, two, six, one. It's not always, the repeated one isn't always in the middle. So, so let's put, do or X, Y, Z, X. We deleted that one. So now these should be all the ones that are not zero. And we want to take angle bracket over all of them, and we want to multiply them together. And then we're going to say physical pole, physical poles n is that. All right, let's, let's check. So with um, n equals 7, k equals 1, we'll try this one. Um, we're going to have uh, physical poles n. This, this is, the output is going to be a little unreadable, so let's just um, split component super amp random nk. So I got this tuple here, not really human readable. And then let's go ahead and evaluate it. Okay, so we've got these rational numbers, and it might not impress you very much that if I multiply this thing, this giant integer, that I might get an integer. But it, might, it should impress you a little bit because um, it turns out the, the individual pieces do have spurious poles, which you can see by this. See, look, they're not integers. You get rational, you get stuff down there. That 163, if it, didn't have any, if it only had physical poles, it would be an integer. So we know that that thing is wrong, or that this thing has spurious poles. So individual terms in BCFW have lots of spurious poles. And we can see that by just integer q, which is, is it an integer or not? Over all of them, false, 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 true, true. Zero is an integer. Um, now we look at the total of all these terms. Ah, integer, integer. Of course, it's the same integer even. Um, indeed. So we want to see integer q, true. All right, seven particle NMHV might not impress you very much. Let's do 10 particle N cubed MHV. 175 terms, lots of falses, lots of lots of spurious poles. This one, it's even hard to see that it's an integer because it runs three lines, but that's why I put the integer Q. And indeed, and you can keep running, and you'll see that this number doesn't change because the recursion doesn't do it, and we're randomizing the method, and it keeps working. So I think we have um, accomplished what we set out to do. We encoded something from scratch. It works. We've internally checked some things that we care about. And I will send, send this out, um, uh, at, we're now at the 90 minute mark, so I will wrap things up now. But this will be sent out by Jenny to, to everybody via email, so you can have a copy of it. But I'd like to just append a little bit of homework if you're interested in it. Um, and the memo would make this, uh, some of this will be easy from the memo, some of it will be actual homework. So the first thing is to, to just speed up everything. So speed up and improve everything. Um, and some of it's really obvious. Like for example, we're doing this recursion relation with replace repeated. We don't have any stored values. So that part's unnecessarily slow. For the same reason that terms in BCFW is unnecessarily slow. So you know, set things, store things to memory. Store to memory. Um, uh, simplify uh, angle brackets brackets, et cetera. So there's lots of things you can do. Um, this is kind of an open-ended homework assignment. Um, more, more importantly, I think, would be to uplift um, the super functions. This is actually kind of an important one, because I promised yesterday that I was, or I promised that I would give you something that would give you tree amplitudes involving gluons and Yang Mills. And that's not actually trivially trivial from what I gave you. And the reason is because we have this kind of a mixed, weird representation. This is a, now we're writing amplitudes involving etas, which are not super fields that we know how to, they're not the normal ones. Eta, the gluons and momentum twisters are linear combinations of gluons and twisters space, or in momentum space. So you need to lift it up. And this is actually explained in the memo, it's on the first section of the memo. So you uplift the super functions to um, momentum space, which means you multiply by this prefactor and you add two more rows to this matrix and now you have something mixed with eta tildes and etas, and you use this definition over here to dot, to change 
the eta coefficients here to eta tilde coefficients. It's a linear map. Anyway, all those details are in the memo. So you just need to add two more rows to the matrix, dot it into another matrix, glue them together, and now you have momentum space super functions. And momentum space super functions are great because that allows you to extract normal gluon amplitudes. Um, uh, the split helicity one, by the way, is proportional to the normal one, so it's basically normal. Momentum space um, super functions involving uh, eta tildes. Um, and then um, generalize the component extraction to allow you to, allow you to, to obtain any um, gluonic helicity component, uh, any gluonic helicity amplitude in pure Yang mills. So I promised it, it's part of your homework, but um, um, I promise it's not that, that difficult. The hard part is the first step. Anyway, thank you very much. Yeah. Any questions? Oh, yeah, yeah. I was wondering, since I'm interested in doing standard stuff in six dimensions, is mm -hmm. there something analogous that we know, or do you even think it's possible to build it somehow? Oh, that's a really great question. Um, uh, the short answer is I don't know. I mean, so there's a, there's a spinner helicity formalism that works nicely in six dimensions and eight dimensions and kind of stops becoming very helpful after 10. Um, but. Uh, but that formalism is, is, is pretty good, but I haven't, I haven't seen it implemented. Defining this kind of linearization of momentum conservation, is probably, uh, it's an interesting question, I don't know. Does anybody know? You should do it, write a paper about it. Oh yeah. So, so I've actually I've been using the same method for a long time. So I'm um, so the, the the main problem with this with the with the way I did it um, is this fact that if you changed what momentum twisters were, so like let's say you threw another random dart, this is now hard coded. Mathematica remembers what NAB is. It's not going to reevaluate it again, and that means you need to clear it from memory, and that. So it means that like you, when you define new twisters, you need to initialize and delete all the old stuff. You can do that. You can do that. But instead, what I normally do is something a little bit more like literally quarantined, where I will have a block and I will say, I will define in the first line of the block, I will say, this is what an angle bracket is. Um, and I will hard code it there. And then I will evaluate the expression. And then I will delete the definition of angle bracket as soon as it's been evaluated. Um, and that has the advantage that it, it always, it, whenever you call it, it looks up the reference, the, the kinematic data at that point, not earlier. Um, but it has a disadvantage of every time you evaluate a new expression, it, it sees angle bracket one through four, and it needs to compute it from scratch again. Yeah. Lance? Yeah. Ah, uh, well, two two real momenta is pretty fine. Um, no, I meant uh, <laughs> the one six for metals is one. Yeah, so actually, I, I, maybe I'll leave that as a small exercise for for for, for the audience as well. Um, so, the at first blush, reality for having real momenta defined in terms of momentum twisters. The first step is that real momenta requires complex lambdas and lambda tildes. So lambdas and lambda tildes have to be locked to each other. They have to be complex conjugates which is actually not such a hard, that, that part's kind of okay. The real problem is that if you want that to be true and you want integers, well, that's a is that uh, I can't simultaneously get real momenta, integer spinners, and momentum conservation at the same time. Experimentals are happy with real numbers. I know, I know, I don't like real numbers very much. Um, 
So, but I, I mentioned, so I, if you look at like the Euler, or sorry, the Pythagorean triples and you do that in D dimensions and you kind of work this out, you can get uh, large sets of things that satisfy uh, P squared equals zero with integers everywhere. Um, but uh, I couldn't get that and spinners without having uh, one square root appear in that expression. And I, I'm not convinced it's impossible. I just don't know how to do it. So, I mean, generating, so generating this for, for actually real momentum means complex twisters. And if you want them to not be real, or if you want them to be integers, it's a big, it's a big complication. Yeah. But you're right. Experimentalists like reals. We can do that. I should say, actually, but the, it comes at a huge cost. Um, using real numbers here comes at a huge cost. Not only would we not be able to do this kind of stupid spurious pole cancellation, but actually, you, you'll notice that if you do these things, um, let, me, let me show you what the kind of things that can go wrong if you, have, uh, if you tried using real numbers. Um, so if, if you look at this, and notice that, the, that uh, the typical numbers here are 10 to the minus 13, 10 to the minus 14. You actually run into precision problems. Um, the terms in the recursion relation are very, very small. You have many terms. And, uh, you really, really need to ramp up the intermediate precision to carry, to get the, to not have mistakes, to not have order precision problems when you sum things. Um, whereas with integers, you know, you get infinite precision. So, um, so you can, so this comparison that like formula one is equal to formula two, in integers, this is a rational function, this is to infinite precision, the check is, is ver verified. If you had to do it with real numbers, We'd be, we'd be comparing things to like 100 digits or something. It would take you a lot more work. Um, yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, you find your twisters to be in a projective space, right? Yeah. And there are super functions. Uh, uh, on, so the determinant is only fixed up to the constant free factor, right? And the yeah. The super function also has like a scaling free. Uh, mm -hmm. Ah, so it's, a, it's actually the same kind of thing. So remember there was this little group redundancy that you could, like without loss of generality, you could use the little group to, to scale the top component of lambda to be one, for example. If you do that for this four vector, you've now set one at, it looks like now it's a three vector, right? Um, and then mu will have two degrees of freedom and, and lambda tilde will have two degrees of freedom. So it's a little group redundancy. Um, and if you look at the phase space, the, the, you know, the, the Lorentz invariant phase space, um, you have like d squared lambda, d squared lambda tilde over GL1. This thing translates into, it's not equal to, there's a Jacobian, um, d4 z um, over GL1. Yeah, so it's the same redundancy. Um. Okay, so I think we should uh, thank uh, Jake uh, for this entire assignment. Mm -hmm. And I guess.